The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hey there, nice to see you. It's time for the Bronx Buzz. This is Bronx Nights program where we talk to reporters and writers and journalists and anybody who's putting stuff out. And that does include photographers, filmmakers, book writers. And in our second segment, it will include comic book creators. So we're going to do that. But uh, to start, we're going to um, get real serious and uh, real important first uh, with the executive editor of City Limits. We're thrilled that Jean Marie Evely has found time in her busy week to spend a few moments with us. Nice to have you with us. Hi, Gary. Nice to be here. Thanks. Uh, So you did a story, a heightened food insecurity in New York City likely to persist long after pandemic wanes, experts say. And I will just introduce it with my own impression, it's just disgraceful. If the fundamental, the fund, maybe even before housing, the fundamental responsibility of a, a, a proper society is to make sure people have enough to eat. And we really have, I mean, they call it food insecurity. You can call it hunger. You can call it whatever you want. So w- what did you discover? The numbers that I saw in your article are bone chilling. Yeah, well, that story in particular was specifically about um, a report that was put out by one particular organization that does food rescue and um, they salvage food. It's called City Harvest. You've probably heard of them. They've been around for a long time. Yeah, so they've been around for several decades and they um, put out a report just about their kind of operations in 2021. And that so that was specifically the numbers was looking at their kind of output in serving food pantries and in serving um you know meeting the need for hunger across the city in this over the last year um but we have been reporting on hunger as an issue obviously throughout the pandemic um you know first in response to kind of the immediate shutdown uh, during the early days of 2020. Um, when I think a lot of people, it was very visible at the time, right? Because I think there were a lot of these um, very visible kind of food pantry lines that we saw everywhere in places like the Bronx. I, really I think I think people there. were shocked. Their jobs yeah. were gone mm-hmm. and they were like, whoa, and I just don't have money right now. It was before uh, the various governmental subsidies, which you yeah. note, have have had an a positive impact, and so yes, the lines were long, and it was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> it's you know the 1920 stock market crash all over again. As yeah, far exactly. As that goes. Yeah, yeah, so so that has been something that obviously, and hunger has been an issue, and food insecurity was an issue in New York, and you know across the country before the pandemic, but the pandemic obviously increased that need exponentially. Um, And what this story really looked at was um, just how that need persists and sort of how stubborn it is. So the um, the City Harvest contact that I spoke to, the executive director there was saying that in their work, for example, after the 2008 um, economic crash, uh, the food insecurity levels that they experienced after that economic downturn really took, she said, almost a decade to recede again. Wow. Um, so even, you know, after the kind of inciting incident that might cause that that need to skyrocket recedes into the background a little bit and isn't making headlines anymore, the need is still there. And she was saying how they finally got the numbers back down to sort of that pre-recession, pre-2000, 2008 recession, and then COVID hit. And then obviously it yeah. went so well, the the numbers that you um, quoted from the City Harvest report uh, that they gave out more than fourteen million pounds of food in June twenty twenty, and I mean that's an incomprehensible number. Yeah. Uh, and they distributed distributed more than eleven million pounds of food every month. So it's eleven million pounds every month, which is more than twice their regular output, which was like five point five million. Yeah. And And this is just one organization. So if you think about what kind of all these networks of um, kind of food rescue systems, obviously the city of New York had its own food emergency response program um, set, you know, setting up food centers at schools in in those kind of first bunch of months. So that was their output. And one of the striking things that she was describing to me too, was how they, 
you know, this isn't a group that normally purchase food themselves. Um, they're a nonprofit. They usually do what they call right. food rescue, which is take unused surplus food from restaurants or farms and things like that and repurpose it for food pantries. But they have kicked in their kind of emergency planning plan, I guess you could say, when the pandemic started and they've been purchasing food every month and have spent a significant amount in addition to the normal amount of food they would Yes, purchase. because the, the donations they would get, uh, let's say, from uh, farms and restaurants used to be somewhat sufficient. Yeah. But now the need is so great, so there has to be funding and other things. There, there's a number in there that I, unless I'm not understanding, um, the number of people in New York City metro area unable to afford enough food peaked at 6.219 million in May of 2020. If you've got eight or nine million people in the city, that's two thirds of the city. I, I, somehow to me, maybe the number is wrong. That just seems like a lot. <laughs> and and if it is that. if it is a lot, wow! It's you know it's it's startling. I do want to uh, I, I want to mention this, and I, you know I guess everything is your personal experience. I was walking, um, and you know the area because you know the Bronx well. I was at Two Forty Second Street in Broadway. I'd come out. I was walking through Van Cortlandt Park, and um, there's a one of those friendly fridges uh, over there. Um, yeah. on, right, and these are just you know people trying to help other people. So the refrigerator is there and uh, people come by and donate food. And they even, like you'll see here, they get, uh, you know, a cob salads from a restaurant that's got leftovers or, you know, made a, too much and didn't sell it and those kinds of things. But to stand there, uh, like, I, like I, when a subway comes, you know, cause that's a, a pretty big transit hub when the subway empties out and watch people come off the subway and go yeah. right to the, the fridge uh, it, 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 as I said, it's, it's just a, it's a disgrace. So here's the, here's a question that you and I can conspire and we get the problem solved. How, do, how do we deal with this? Well, you know, it, it seems to me it takes a village and all that. We talk about donations, we talk about restaurants, but it's poverty, right? This is the bottom line. Uh, yeah, poverty I mean, I, and jobs and all that. I think it's, you know, it's, again, one of those kind of interwoven economic issues. And just to touch on that number that you mentioned, that's the stat for the New York metro area. So that includes like New Jersey. All right. So it's out of 40 of million. It's kind okay. of the dry state area. Um, that, that's I, how you I got. I double checked it. Um, no, but I have but, to say that's how you got to be the editor. And I'm just. <laughs> Just making sure. I was like, did I get it wrong? Um, perfect. So the way that um, the sources were talking to me about it was that, you know, food becomes, I think the way that she described it was it's like this elastic expense, right? So um, especially right this month, we're going to have the state's uh, eviction moratorium is going to end. Um, if you are somebody who is on a very, very tight budget, you are not going to skip paying rent if you can swing it, right? But you might skip your grocery bill or cut back on that. Um, food is kind of the thing that people, uh... I think, they make that cut first, which obviously has huge implications for health and well-being um, outside of that. But I think there is this this kind of tendency to do that when you're in a tough spot is right. that maybe you're going to pull back on the right. food. So you, so you don't buy, you know, a nicer meat in the store, let's say, and you'll go to a TV dinner, which you can buy a half a dozen of those for whatever. For yeah, or maybe you're going to skip something. a meal or Absolutely. parents who will skip meals that's so right. that their kids can have a meal. Right. Um, that right. sort of when, when people are tight, they say, well, I'll skip lunch this week. You know, exactly, that kind yeah. of thing. That, that is a very, very good point. Um, what, one thing which you did mention, and goodness, that's another whole show, and I'm sure you, you or your staff will do writing on it, is the whole idea of the eviction moratorium. Yeah. Um, I wonder if there will be any extension or this is it. Um, we're keeping tabs on that for sure. Um, I know that obviously, um, you know, it, it's yet to be determined whether or not the, um, I'm sorry, my dog is like growling. He wants me to pick him up. So I he, he, for, he might be hungry. Noises in the background. It's my dog. He, um, he might be hungry. It's not, it's not me. Um, he probably is. Um, but uh, I know that lawmakers are pushing for this good cause eviction bill this legislative session, and they're hoping that that could also help keep people in their homes. It'll make it harder for landlords to evict um, tenants without having to show cause. Um, so we'll see. The I think it ends the 15th. So um, you, you know, what, what was instructive in your piece um, was, and, and I'll just quote right from it, experts say the hunger crisis could have been worse were it not for the number of government benefit and relief programs 
uh, that were rolled out in response to the COVID crisis. You know, I, I understand it costs money. What costs more? Uh, you know, you know, it's like this yeah. situation with people not being able to eat or saying, you know, I mean, and, and I'm I'm trying not to be political about it. I'm trying to be practical about it. And I see these regular bronchites working and coming down and go, having to go to a fridge to get food for tonight. Yeah. I, I, you know, um, so so that's another thing that um, I guess goes back. And you mentioned this was to the Biden Build Back Better plan, because there would be child care money and all kinds of other things in there that would help um, needy families. Yeah, I think that that's one thing the report really spelled out was that those earlier um, benefits really did help um, kind of alleviate what would have been a lot worse in terms of need. Um, do you um, uh, do, do you have an experience? Now, City Harvest did that report. Um, do we have a, a sense of, of how bad in the Bronx um, you know, I know there are so many organizations, whether it be Wedco or Bronx Works and all these other groups that are, um, you know, working on this. Um, do do we have a sense of, or we just make the assumption we're on a lower end um, economically and health yeah. wise and so I don't we know. have it worse? I was actually trying to find that right before we got on this phone call. I was looking at some of the You stuff. knew I would ask. <laughs> um, so I don't have those hard numbers in front of me at the moment. I don't have recent ones. Um, but I do know that the Bronx's unemployment rate is the highest out of all the boroughs too. Yep. So obviously that feeds into um, the issue of like who can afford what. Um, and it definitely, you know, like we said, it's very interconnected, all these different things. Um, right. And here we are first week of January. We're going to take a look at that and circle that January 15th date because that is a date that things uh, might change. Um, talk to me about um, what, I don't know, what, what's your day like? What are you working on and what's next uh, for uh, City Limits that we should look for? Uh, city Limits. So we are um, obviously, uh, we had just had a big piece that came out today, if you want to check it out. I believe one of my coworkers had been on your show um, earlier in the month to talk about uh, part of our series, which is looking back on the impact of the de Blasio rezonings that took place yes, earlier. Of term. course. So, Essay, I think, came on to talk about the Jerome Avenue rezoning and the reporting that she did on that. Um, right. It's not Bronx related, but we have a big story out today related to the impact of the East New York rezoning and talking oh. about sort of how that impacted home prices in that neighborhood. I, I, I beg to differ. A rezoning in another part of New York City is a Bronx story because... We, yeah. You know, um, Eric Adams has not sworn off the concept, to say the least, and um, th it, there's no question it's going to come our way soon enough. Thank you so much. And uh, coming up next, we will um, be doing, I'll put on my other hat, and uh, we'll be doing something totally different. We'll talk with a comic book creator who has a very interesting point of view, a different point of view about who comic book heroes should be. So we'll take a break. We'll be right back. Don't go away. When taking public transportation, don't touch your phone. Carry hand sanitizer and use it immediately upon leaving the bus or train. Avoid touching your face. If someone is coughing or sneezing, move away. Wash your hands with soap and water as soon as possible. Limit contact with poles. If possible, avoid rush hour. Don't eat or drink on public transportation. Keep your bag off the floor or other surfaces. Avoid directly touching turnstiles. Stay up to date with the latest from your local health department and CDC.
Okay, back with you on the Bronx Buzz. I said we're going to change gears, and we are going to change gears. I want you to uh, meet somebody who's been on the show before. Maybe you saw him, maybe you didn't. Uh, it is um, comic book creator, H.H. Uh, German. Nice to have you with us, H.H. Nice to see you again. Thank you, Gary. Nice to see you, too. Happy New Year to you and the team. And Happy New Year to you. Let's all stay um, happy, peaceful, healthy, and safe. That would be great. Anyway, mm-hmm. aside from our wishes here, um, let, let's just talk about, if I remember correctly, when you were on uh, the last time, uh, we talked about Sigma Comics and um, the the first in an eight-issue series, right? That's what we talked about. Talk to me about um, Sigma, the um, series, and ladies and gentlemen, drum roll. We're uh, up to issue number four. <laughs> That's right. That's so right. tell us all about it. Right. Well, Here Comes Calico is a series, a comic book series that fights animal abuse through comics. And we have a wonderful hero by the name of the Calico. And the Calico is a Bronx, a Bronx guy who uh, currently finds himself living in, in Brooklyn. And uh, he's getting regular updates on people who abuse and kill animals. So uh, he, he deals with it in a very uh, terminal way, let's say. Let's leave it at that. Why, why and how did you get so involved in animal rights that you wanted a dead? Because, listen, this is not just writing an essay or an op-ed piece. This is like major creation. And I know uh, Rebecca has some pictures. Let's show some of the some of the characters and things. So tell us how you got into it. The foundation is bullying. Right. So uh, bullying is something that all kids, unfortunately, have to deal with uh, to some extent, uh, you know, usually starts pretty early on. And, uh, you know, it can go into adulthood, too. And, uh, you know, when you think about bullying, we think about it as person to person. But when you abuse an animal, I mean, you're basically bullying them. And it's even more extreme because, you know, if you have a pet uh, at home, you're in some cases many, uh, many times bigger than, than the pet. And think about being picked up by a human if you're a little cat or a dog. I mean, you're, you're like a giant. Imagine a giant picking you up off the street right. and, and hitting you. It's it's right. terrifying. And then and then on top of that, you know, these animals have just de- undevoted, just complete devotion to their pet owners. They, they see themselves. That, as their there's family. no question about that. They're so loyal and devoted to you, and then they keep coming back for that love, and you just keep doing. It. It's just horrible. And and the the context at which we have this character and how he goes about avenging this abuse is, is truly remarkable. It's never been done, frankly. It's, it's been called the pioneering comic book, and we're really proud to be a part of it. Um, just out of curiosity, um, you had witnessed something like that. You have your own pets. You just read about it. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm always interested in an artist's muse. Sure. What was that drove you to make not only a statement or as right. I said it right. but such a, a full-fledged kind of commitment of everything right. to it well it's such a great question Gary um the Bronx frankly is a big part of it right so I grew up in the Bronx um you know in the Pelham Bay section and uh you know this is a, a tough tough area growing up and uh, you had a you had to deal with bullying quite a bit and you know some people don't know this but the Bronx has a uh, Tons of greenery. It's one of the, it's the greenest of all. Of of the borough of parks. You, yeah, right. sure. So we got a lot of wonderful animals, right? You know, playing with us. Uh, some of us, some of them are friends who are in the park. Some of us are our pets. So I unfortunately got to see some mistreatment. And knowing the bullying, I could just imagine what was going through those poor little animals. Well, uh, and so know. if you witnessed it, even one incident, you could only imagine what daily life would be like. Wow. Um, sure. Fantastic. And and let's um, talk about the creation of um, the, the superheroes. Um, right. Uh, talk, talk to me about what you created. What did you try to do with it, et cetera? Right. Well, the hero's name is Hector Gill. And again, a Bronx guy that is getting intelligence. He's being fed intelligence from all around the country on people who abuse and kill animals. So our process, or I should say my process in, in creating the character was frankly based on you know my, my experience growing up in the Bronx and also being influenced by boxing. The character is a boxer. So he leverages his fighting skill set to go after these bad guys. So here, here is basically a street fighter, someone who uh, was raised in the, you know, let's call them the mean streets of, of New York, the Bronx. And uh, he's leveraging not only his background in growing up in the Bronx and his experience, but also his fighting prowess in dealing with these uh, people who are just the, 
the I, I have no words for L lowest the, of the low. Is that what yeah. we want to say? The lowest. Yeah, of I, the have, low? I have. I have more choice words that can't be uttered on, on the show. Right? <clears throat> what, what is interesting also in, um, you know, the way you described it in the background of it is the notion of bullying. Right. It, it, clearly, it's a larger issue than it used to be. We know what's going on politically and out there in the world. People have less patience and all that kind of thing. And for kids who don't know how to express really their anger, it becomes very easy to look at somebody who's different, whether they be, you know, uh, disabled in some form or, of course, different ethnicity, or maybe they're not as athletic as you are, you and your friends are, might be. And and it, there's really been this kind of psychological undercurrent um, amongst kids, right? right? I mean, and if you're going to reach them, I'm assuming this is the way to reach them. Right. I grew up with, uh, you know, witnessing and experiencing bullying. Uh, day to day. And frankly, I was able to, you know, overcome my situation. Mm -hmm. And but like, like you said, it is a timely topic. So when people pick up our comic books, you know, they feel uh, a direct connection to what's going on today with the pulse of living in today's society. So, you know, what better medium than comic books to uh, interact with, you know, young people today. And frankly, people of all ages, because, you know, people who read our comic books are of, of all ages. So it's a wonderful, unique approach to fighting this incredibly uh, unfortunate topic, and we think we have we have a winner here. Do do you um, uh, have you heard from other people, from readers and others who have said, "Wow, this is a really good." Even parents who say, "You know what, this is a good concept." I'm assuming you have every day. And you know, when we started, another great question. So we hear we hear about this every day, and people really connecting with our comic book and in their familial situation. But also, you know, we just started doing these uh, comic book conventions, which you know right. we, we hadn't done up until recently. And we have an outpouring. When, when people actually see you face to face, it's just an outpouring of support. Wow. It's incredible. And that's, that's really where you see it more pronounced. And, and of course, you and I talked about this last time you were on. If you want to reach kids, um, as happy as I am with the talk show format, uh, you know, put a comic book in their hands and, and you, you got a half, a half a chance to reach them. All right, let's talk about um, issue number four that's coming out. What do you do every month? Is that what we do? Here it is. Look at this. Yeah, it's a stunner. It's a really gorgeous uh, issue. And we credit uh, Garner Biel, our cover artist there, Daniel Grimaldi doing the colors. Interiors by Javier, Javier Orbich. Uh, wonderful uh, creative team and yours truly on the writing. Uh, issue four deals with, uh, well, let's just say that up until now, the calico has gone up against just regular civilians who have been terrible people to animals. This is the first time in the series that he's coming up against a bona fide supervillain. So this is someone who has way more uh, power and resources behind them. Uh, and uh, he, let's just say the calico has his, fan, his hands full. In issue four, <laughs> uh, how how long does it take you to write them uh, and and put them out and then coordinate with with the artist or artists? Um, you know, be, because again, you're just talking about it here in a minute or two. Right. Yet this this is uh, the you know given birth after a period of time. Right. Well, the series was actually completely written uh, last year during the quarantines, the first quarantines that we had for COVID, and uh, but admittedly. What I do is my process is I write the whole thing as an outline, and then uh, I go in and do an extra layer of uh, dialogue. And then prior to an issue uh, being uh, prepared, I do extensive editing, and that's that could be pretty substantial. I mean, we're we talking, we talking six months, a year, two years, five years? Oh, no, one we're, year, we're talking about two weeks. You know, <laughs> yeah, no. We're talking about uh, two to three uh, months overall, and then right. individually – about two weeks to do the editing. And, and the artists are, um, are are pretty good, right? The artists are incredible. You know, oh, we've been sorry. very fortunate. The artists are incredible. I didn't want to say yeah. pretty good. Yes, they're pretty incredible. I, they, they work really well with me. You know, it helps uh, having gone to art school. So I'm a graduate of the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan. And uh, I'm able to storyboard the entire comic book. Uh, and it's a wonderful help to them because, you know, they're able to right. see exactly how I want this stuff laid out. So it's a very direct connection with the artists. 
which is uh, atypical in, in the comic book creative process. So I, I want to get back to the eight issue uh, series. Uh, this is yeah. number four. Um, right. uh, have you laid out the others twofold? Number one, in terms of what you what you're going to do with them. And, I, and if you don't want to say, you don't have to. And well, uh, number two, uh, are there dates? Do you say, well, we have the next one out by May or April? I don't know, whatever. Right. So to the first question, yes, uh, everything is pretty much laid out. And again, that's the outline from a script perspective. In, in terms of uh, the actual uh, creative uh, art, it is not. So I have a meeting with our interior artist and we typically have every five pages, we have a very brief meeting just so that we go over the storyboards, exactly how we need everything positioned. So uh, it's wow. comic book that, 24 pages. So it's, that, you know, that is, that is a, a, so fascinating and so interesting. Um, here is really a novice question. I'm sorry. I'm not, I, I was a comic book guy when I was a kid, not lately. Um, how do you sell them? You, presumably they're for sale. How, right. how do you sell them? You put them on, on the web. Um, I mean, of course, in the old days, we'd go down to the candy store and, and for a dime, you'd right. get the DC comics. Um, right. What's the what's the market like? What's the commerce like? Well, so we have many different avenues now, right? So you mentioned one of them, the website. You can get our series if you go to sigmacomics.com. That's our website, S-I-G-M-A comics.com. And we also, as I mentioned, uh, we have the comic book conventions and we have them all across the country. So if we're in your town, you know, come come check us out and you'll get our comics that way. We yeah. also sell direct to the comic book stores. So, so you, you could also um, go online and order comics, right? Uh, I mean, like you would order anything else. Right. And the latest the latest way to get it. And we're we're going to have to run. Now, so be quick. Sure. Right? kickstarter.com issue four is available right now for pre-order right and that's where we really want you to go right now because you can get it as a collectible right something to read as entertainment and you know i, one I almost called you hh H. calico hh H. german <laughs> and uh, uh this is um uh here comes calico fourth here, edition it's out here comes calico. there you go, go to kickstarter hey. Hey, man, thank you. We love artists. We love creative people in the Bronx. We love people with a point of view, and you are one of them. So thank you so much. Thank you. Get to kickstarter.com and support Here Comes Calico. Thank you so much. Great. Um, that's it. HH, uh, Happy New Year to you, and also Happy New Year to Jean Marie Ellie, who was on our first segment. And guess what? Happy New Year to you. We'll see you next week. Good night.